Someone sounds out of breath. <laughs> good morning, church. So good to be with all y'all this morning. It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord together. Um, I am so, it's so great to have all of you here with us, especially if you're visiting with us. Um, and we, if you are visiting with us, we'd like to get to know you a little bit better. So if you could do us a favor, um, on the seat or pew in front of you, there should be a little white card. Um, if you could take that, fill that out, and then place that into one of our collection boxes that we have mounted at each of our exits whenever you leave here today. This is so we can get a record of your visit. Um, we want you guys to feel at home here. Feel, uh, feel free to worship with us and uh, as a part of our family here at FBC Buda. Uh, before we continue in our worship service, we do have a few announcements that I want to get your eyes on. Uh, first being, uh, we have a ministry here at the, at the church called Tabitha Sewing. It's a wonderful little ministry. Um, and they prepare these prayer shawls. Um, and those are actually, they have a bunch of them. They're all unique. They're all available in the uh, office area. If you would like one of those, or if you know someone who uh, may be in need of that, medium prayer or some comfort, please feel free to pick one of those up. Um, take those. Uh, those are for you, a blessing from the church and from our Tap of the Sewing ministry. Um, also coming out uh, or in the foyer area right now um, is a sign-up sheet for our men's prayer breakfast. Our men's prayer breakfast will be October 5th at 8 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. It's a great time of fellowship we have uh, with the men of the church. Um, we have a sign-up sheet because we need to know how many breakfast tacos to get you guys. Um, so be sure um, if you plan on attending, uh, sign up out there. It's going to be um, a great time that we have together. Um, September is a special missions emphasis week for Reach Texas, which is a, a ministry uh, sponsored by the WMU, um, or we're going through the WMU to raise funds, um, and it all goes to local missions and evangelism efforts here in the state of Texas. Um, our goal as a church is to raise uh, $3,500. To date, we have received $1,508. So uh, we invite you all to please pray and give uh, as, as the Lord leads you to give to that. Again, all the proceeds to, to the REACH Texas go to uh, state, local um, missions and evangelism efforts for that. Alrighty, uh, there are a bunch of other really good announcements that are in our bulletin. If any of those apply to you, be sure that you get a bulletin, check those out, uh, see what all is coming up, what's on the schedule, and what's around the corner for all of us. Uh, in the meantime, for this service, uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to continue uh, worshiping the Lord together. So, will you bow with me for a word of prayer? 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much um, for the opportunity we have to be in your house this morning. Um, God, it's something that we do uh, every single week. But Father, I pray that this is not something that we, get, that we take for granted. Lord, this is the time where we get to gather together as your people under one roof, as one body, singing with one voice your praises. And so, Father, we pray for this time. May this be an offering that is sacred and holy before you. And, Father, we ask and we plead and we invite you into this place this morning. Um, use this time. Use the songs that we sing of how great you are. Use the word that we're going to sit under and the teaching that we hear today. Use it all to speak to the hearts of your people, every single one of us. No matter where we have come from, no matter where we are right now in our relationship with you, I pray that this time, Lord, you move and you speak because you know what each of our hearts need. You know the encouragement we need. You know the convictions we need. You know the, the guidance we need, Father. And I pray, Lord, that you make your will known to us this morning. That all, everything that is said, everything that is sung from this place would be fully about you and glorifying you. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to be in this place and to worship your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to continue our singing with hymn number 484. We're going to sing all the verses to higher ground. Then we're going to give you a chance to sing I'll Fly Away With Us. And then we're going to sing Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. Stand with us. <coughs> Thank you. 
Time for Children's Church. Boys and girls, pre-K to second grade, you can meet your leadership there in the back. There's your leadership. They're coming. Amen. Amen. What a, what a sweet time of worship this morning. Thank you for being here to worship with us and uh, appreciate so much um, you guys um, coming each week, week being faithful to uh, spend your Sunday morning with us. I, I like what Trey said and I always say it too. If you're visiting with us, uh, so thankful you've chosen to spend uh, your time with us this morning and uh, hope that already God has ministered to your heart and spoken to you and that that will continue as we um, open his word together this morning. So, so thankful that you're here today. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer before we um, take a look at um, what God's laid on my heart this week to share with you. And let's just ask him uh, this morning to open our ears and our hearts to uh, hear him, receive from him what he asked for. So would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you this morning again for um, your presence in this place. Uh, Father, already for opportunities this morning that we have had to be in your word, uh, in our Bible study hour, thank you for each person that participated in that, each of our teachers that so faithfully teach your word each week. And 
And God, now we thank you for this time that you give us to gather in this place and worship you this morning. Thank you for the reminders this morning, the message in song that reminds us, Father, of all that you've done for us. All the promises in your word. That we have a future for sure in heaven when we're yours. And that one day we're going to be with you. Thank you for the reminder, God, that whatever we face or go through each day of our life, Father, you walk with us through those times. And God, as we gather in this place this morning, God, all of that is a reason and a cause for us to lift up and praise and exalt your name. And Father, your word says that when your name is lifted up, when you are lifted up, you will draw all men to yourself. When Jesus is exalted and lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And that's the desire of our heart in this place this morning. God, I pray that with one heart and a unity of heart this morning, our cry to you would, Father, be that we want to exalt and lift up and praise and worship and adore your name. And Father, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place this morning. God, already I believe that you are at work. God, you are faithful, Father, to show up when two or more show up in your name. God, you are here. And God, I pray, Lord, that um, for the next little bit of time, um, you would just help us to focus in and center, as always, on what you want to say to us. God, I pray that we would um, not be distracted, God, by the things going on around us for the next little bit. We wouldn't be distracted even by the things going on in our own life. And some God, sometimes, God, it's hard to uh, get past that. It's hard, Father, to put aside, God, our own personal struggles and worries and doubts and fears. And yet, God, my prayer right now is that, Lord, for the next little bit of time, you would help us not to be focused on that, but, God, just to be focused on you, to hear you. God, to let you speak right where we are. Let you speak your words of healing and grace and mercy and comfort and peace and salvation right where we are. And we ask, Father, this morning that um, as your word goes out and it says about itself, it never returns void, it never returns empty. We pray that as your word goes out this morning, God, that not one person within the sound of my voice, sitting in this room or listening at home, not one person, God, could miss you, what you want to say to us, what you want to do in us. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to take over this service. Bless, anoint, put your hand on me, help me to step out of the way this morning and just let you speak, let you have your perfect way. Let you work and move, God, because I just believe with all of my heart that when you speak and we hear, we will be changed. God, that when your word goes out and you are glorified and magnified and lifted up through your word, that we will be drawn to you and we will be changed. Help us to be changed this morning. Changed by you. Changed by your truth. And Lord, what you do here in this place today, we will be careful to give you and you alone all the honor and the glory and the praise for what you do. We will walk out of this place this morning praising and rejoicing and exalting the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, for all that you've done in this place today. We love you. We praise you. We commit this time to you. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you've got your Bible with you this morning, um, if you would be finding the New Testament book of Colossians, we're going to be in Colossians, the very first chapter today. That's where we're going to kind of uh, kind of plant it this morning as we continue on in a series of messages that we began a few weeks ago uh, that we have been calling prison prayers. Um, uh, these are some fantastic prayers, I believe, some of the most beautiful, powerful, even life-changing prayers in all of Scripture that were prayed by the Apostle Paul at times in his life when he sat in a prison cell. And that makes them um, even more graphic, even more telling and important to us, I believe. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit each week, um, but if you think about it, when you're sitting in a prison cell, when you've been arrested, 
there's not a lot you can do but maybe twiddle your thumbs. But we found that you can pray. And that's what we find Paul doing. And we've already talked about this a little bit, but of all the things that Paul could have prayed while he sat in a prison cell, and we'll talk more about that here in just a minute, but of all the things that he could have prayed, it's interesting that he didn't pray for himself. He prayed for you. Actually, he prayed for believers in his day, in places um, around the New Testament world where the gospel was quickly spreading. Paul didn't pray for himself when he sat in a prison cell. He prayed for believers. He prayed for Christians in the world. And by implication, he prayed for us. Now, so far in our series, we've been learning a lot about prayer. Specifically, we have learned that sometimes we get the notion, the purpose, the idea of prayer all backwards. And we've already learned that some of the things we ought to be praying for in our life, if you've missed the previous messages, maybe you can jot some of these things down. We've already learned specifically um, that that we ought to be praying um, not for God to give us things, but we ought to be praying specifically to know God. God, I want to know you. We ought to be praying to know him intimately. We ought to be praying to know him confidently. Um, and we ought to be praying to know him joyfully. And then there's that fourth point we didn't get to on that first week, fully, even as he is known. Specifically, you know, our prayers kind of sometimes kind of degenerate into us asking God to bless us, to give us things. But what we've learned so far is that that's not what prayer ought to look like at all. Our prayers ought to be focused towards knowing God, getting to know him, knowing him deeper, fuller, more intimately in our life. And then we've also learned that specifically we ought to be praying in our life for our faith to show, right? Right? We ought to be praying that our love would grow. This is what we looked at last week. We ought to be praying specifically um, that we would more and more in our life allow our faith to show in ways where it's not just a profession of the lips, but, but it's actually the way we live our life. We, we ought to be praying that our life would glow to the glory of God. And we spend a lot of time talking about that. So interesting so far, we've kind of discovered, and we've been saying this each week as kind of a, a key kind of theme for this study. We've been making this statement, and I'll put it on the screen again this morning, but it's what we've been talking about, that the purpose, the primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do things for you, but to get God to do things in you. That, that the primary purpose of our praying is not, bless me, bless me, bless me, and Paul teaches us this himself as he sits in a prison cell, not praying for himself, but praying for others, right? It's, it's not this prayer that's for, for us to get God to do something for us, but it's for us to get God to do something in us, to do a work in us. And I think that type of prayer always leads us to a fresh surrender to him, to know him deeper, to know him better in a more intimate way. I think when that happens, it causes us to understand why certain things happen in our life the way we do. they do instead of us praying, God, remove those things from my life. God's at work in us, right? It's all a part of his plan. I've also shared this statement with you because I love it, and I think it's a part of the main purpose of prayer. It's from that great Oswald Chambers who wrote so many great books about prayer and devotion to God and We've read this one, and he said this, our common ideas regarding prayer are not found in the New Testament. We look upon prayer simply as a mean of, means of getting things for ourselves. But the biblical purposes of prayer is that we may get to know God himself. God, help me know you. Help me to go deeper in my walk with you. Now, as I was preparing for this third message in our series this week, I was reading different things about prayer, and I came across a statement that really kind of arrested my attention. I thought this was a very interesting statement. Um, it's a statement that's attributed to different spiritual leaders and uh, Christian philosophers and things like that, but it bears no inscription of who said it. So I'm just calling it an anonymous quote, but, but this one really kind of made me think about how important prayer is. And, and this is what the statement said that I read this week. You just think about this. You can tell what a person likes by what they do. And you can tell what a person thinks by what they say. But you can tell what a person is by how they pray. That is a 
pretty powerful statement, profound statement if you think about it. Let's look at it again. I, th- I believe it's there on the screen. So just think about this statement and what it's telling. I think it's telling us something about how important prayer really is, right? So, so think about what he says here. You can tell what a person likes by what they do. And, and you can tell what a person thinks by what they say. But you can tell what a person is what, who they are, what, what they're like, what really makes up their life. You can tell what a person is by how they pray. Listen, listen, Christian, your prayer life says everything about you. It says a lot about where you are spiritually. Um, it says a lot about what you think about God, about how big your God is, right? About your estimation of what he can or can't do or can't handle. It says everything for us. And, and we've been saying every week in this series about how absolutely paramount prayer is for our life. Now, I, I don't know um, how often we really hear messages, sermons, or series of messages on the subject of prayer. Maybe in Bible study, we might talk about prayer a lot. And I think often again, uh, it, it kind of degenerates into us talking about um, how to pray, pray to get God's blessing, how to pray to get God to do something effectively in my life. And I will continue to maintain that prayer is not about that. It's about you getting to know God. It's about you getting into the heart of God. And we've been saying over and over again about how absolutely paramount prayer is for us. Last week, we even made that dramatic statement that prayer for a Christian is the air that you breathe. Remember? And that you would no sooner in your life stop breathing, you would die, right? then a Christian ought to think stopping prayer in their life. It's absolutely essential for us. Remember the statement from Dr. John Piper who said, nothing is nothing is more vital than prayer in a Christian's existence. And he went on to say, look at it, and few things are more vulnerable to neglect. We looked at that. Uh, remember this one from Andrew Murray that great theologian who wrote so much on prayer. He said, every great move of God was birthed in a movement of prayer. And D.L. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. It's true. And remember this one from R.C. Sproul last week. It plays right into this idea of how essential prayer is for us. R.C. Sproul said, prayer is to the Christian what breath is to life. And then he also kind of echoed what Piper said when he said, yet no duty of the Christian is so neglected. Wow, that's amazing. Another one from Oswald Chambers who said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And R.A. Torrey, prayer is the key that unlocks all, powerful, all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. Wow, think about that. That's what we have at our disposal. And I want you to just get your head around this for a second as we're kind of continuing on in this series and we're thinking about these powerful prayers that Paul prayed from a prison cell. You know, I think Paul realized how powerful prayer is. And when we move past today's message, we're going to start to see that, how powerful prayer really is. But, but I want you to get this. When you study Scripture, you are studying the story of a God who at the very beginning created everything by just speaking it, right? I say it often like this from the pulpit. God is the one who created everything that you see by mere spoken word. And prayer puts you directly in the presence of that God. There is nothing you are going through, nothing you are facing personally. There's nothing this church is facing. There's nothing that our country is facing. We're facing some big stuff. There's nothing our world is facing today, and there's some big stuff going on in our world, right? There is nothing going on in this world today that God can't handle. And you and I as believers need to understand that we have right at our hands this most powerful tool that God could possibly give us, and that is the privilege of coming into the very presence of the one who holds it all together. You and I must never take for granted this tool that we've been given in prayer, as we've been reading. It's the very air that you breathe. It's the most important life-changing thing that you can have. And the quote we just read, it opens the very storehouses of heaven. Boy, that we could develop this kind of prayer in our own life. 
I'll throw one more quote in there for you from Dr. Billy Graham, who said this, because I think this is so pertinent to where we are as a nation. As a nation. To get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. And it's true. Billy Graham's gone to be with the Lord. He did his part. I believe he heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I'm going to tell you that if you want to hear those words one day, prayer's going to make a difference for you. God wants his people to be kneeling Christians, praying Christians, tapped into the very power of God. And so here we are again in this series talking about these prison prayers. And what I find so fascinating about these prison prayers as you think about Paul's life, Paul wrote a large portion of our New Testament. Paul's life was not an easy one. I mean, most of us have some struggles and some pains in our life, and we're often bemoaning our fate every single day. But go study Paul's life sometime. From the moment that he came to know Jesus, it was not all rose-smelling gardens, but it was the thorns and the thistles in the garden. His life from the moment he came to Christ was one of treachery and difficulty and challenges and persecution. From place to place, he would preach the gospel, he would preach about the love of God, and they'd throw rocks at him, beat him, and throw him in a prison cell. And every time he was in a prison cell, Paul began to praise and worship and pray to God. And God began to move. Ask yourself today why we're getting to sit in a church like this and worship him. It's because someone like that prayed a long time ago and the gospel spread to where you would one day hear it. You and I are the benefactors of the powerful prayers of this man. And I'm telling you, it's in scripture for a reason. Everything in this book is important. We must not miss any of it. All of it speaks to us. All of it is relevant. And why is the Bible so careful to tell us about these prayers that Paul prayed from prison because he wants us to learn how to pray. He wants us to learn the secrets of what prayer really looks like. Now let's think about that this morning as we're kind of looking at this passage of scripture. Again, we're going to be in the very first chapter of Colossians. We've been in Ephesians and we've been in Philippians, different letters that Paul wrote from a prison cell. And we've got to hear these prayers. But the one we're going to read today is specifically very unique and powerful. I want you to look at it with me if you would. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. You'll find the prayer in verses 9 through 14. And this is a great prayer. I don't want you to miss it. Get your pens out, your highlighter. If you're one who writes in your Bible, there's a lot of stuff to underline here and write. You want to know how to pray? You want to know how to pray powerfully? You want to know how to pray every single day? Look at this passage of Scripture. There's some things that set this prayer apart from the others that I'll point out to you, but I want you to hear this. If you've got your Bible there, follow with me. Um, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Here's what we read. You ready? Here we go. Under God's inspiration, this is what we get in Scripture for our lives today. Here's what he says. Paul writes, For this reason we also, since the day we heard of it, speaking of their faith, the believers at Colossae, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. And then this is a big ask from here to verse 14. Look at all that he asked. This is his prayer. To not cease to pray for you and to ask all of these things. That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins." Is that not great? What a powerful prayer. Listen to me, Christian. Just kind of take that passage, highlight it. This is how you ought to pray for yourself every single day, every day. This is what you ought to be praying for each other every single day. You ought to be praying this for your church, for believers, the one sitting next to you this morning. You start praying for this. This is a life-changing prayer. Oh, that we could do what verses 9 through 14 actually says. If God would answer this prayer, and this is a prayer that he will answer, okay? If God would answer this prayer in the life of a church and the life of a believer, what do you think our church would look like today? What do you think the Christian culture 
today. I'm not talking about the culture in general, but the Christian culture, which I believe is in trouble today. What do you think it would look like if this became our prayer? This is a powerful, powerful prayer. Maybe of the other prayers that we looked at, the other prayers are very important and very powerful in their own right, right? Pray to know God better, intimately, right? Joyfully, confidently. Pray to know Him. Pray to grow in your love, right? Pray, pray to be more grounded in Him. But look at this prayer. This is so powerful, such a powerful prayer. Now, I want to show you something about this prayer that I think makes it very, very unique. Um, it's uniquely different because in the first two prayers we've looked at, in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Philippians, the thir- first two prayers that we've examined, Paul was praying for churches that he actually founded on one of his missionary journeys. He had visited. He'd spent time in those churches. And he knew the believers in those churches personally. But this is interesting about this prayer. Paul had never been to Colossae. He didn't found the church there. He'd never been there. He didn't know a single Christian in Colossae, but this is the prayer he prayed. That's powerful. I thought about that. Paul recognized the importance of the continuing, ongoing work of the gospel, reaching people for Jesus Christ. And it's why when I read this prayer, I go, he was praying this prayer for me. He was praying this prayer for you. He's teaching you and I in God's inspired word how we ought to pray, how we ought to be given to prayer in this passage of Scripture. It's so powerful. And I think as you think about this, Paul didn't know a single person there by name. He he didn't know the believers at Colossae. He'd never been there. But this is the power of the prayer he prayed. And so I'm calling this prayer Paul's carpe diem prayer. Okay, And that's what I've titled this third message in our series, Carpe Diem Praying. Do you know what? Carpe diem means. It's probably a a phrase or a term that you've heard all of your life. Carpe diem, literally it's a Latin phrase that means to seize the day, to make the most. And you may think, well, where are you getting that? Look at your Bible there and notice what he says in verse 9. If you think, well, where are you getting that? Here's what he he says in verse 9. He says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. You see that? He seizes every opportunity, every day to pray this prayer for believers at Colossae, for believers in the New Testament world, for believers that would come in future generations. I believe this is a scriptural, biblical prayer that doesn't end in New Testament times, but speaks of wise and is relevant for today. This is the prayer that Paul would be praying for us. It's what he would pray. He would seize the day to pray this. Now, literally that phrase, you've always heard it as, um, as, as seize the day, but literally the phrase harpe diem means to pluck the day when it's ripe. It means something like this, um, that you should live for today and not worry about tomorrow. You should take opportunities as they come to you today, that when God gives you an opportunity, you should take advantage of that. I don't think Paul ever missed an opportunity to pray. We're going to see more of this as we continue on. But, but here's something I want you to think about. Paul, just because he was in a prison cell, did not miss the opportunity to pray. And you think, listen, I just don't have time to pray every day. I rush right into my day. It's one of those things I know that I ought to do, but I'm just so busy and, and I'm running late and I'm doing all of these things. Listen, you ought to seize every opportunity to be in the front of the living God. Not only for your own life, but for your family, right? Moms, dads, for your kids, right? You ought to seize the day every day to pray like this for believers around you, for your church, for our nation, for Christians and believers that you know, for one another and for yourself. We ought to pray like this. And I think that um, as you think about this saying, carpe diem, it's really not a biblical um, statement. It's a Latin phrase. It means to take, make the most of the opportunities that you have and it's, and it's a powerful one if you think about it. But there's obviously some good merit to it. And I even believe that it has scriptural precedent. Now, now think about this. There's a great verse that we love to quote in John 6, Seek first the kingdom of God, right? We all know that verse. And maybe we've never really paid attention to it, but read it in, read it in context. But here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, and 34. Listen to this. Tell me this isn't a seize the day passage. Here's what he says. But seek first the kingdom of God. And by the way, Seeking has to do with prayer. 
right? Seek him in prayer. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you today. But look at verse 34. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, seize the day. Don't worry about tomorrow right now. Seize the day. Take advantage. Take the opportunity right now. Seek him today. Seek him first. And the Bible often speaks in the terms of us seizing the moment, seizing the day. Carpe diem, if you think about that. Um, we hear Paul say things like, today is the day of salvation. Seize the day. That if God speaks to your heart today, don't put off till tomorrow what he tells you to do today. Seize the day. In Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, we read these words. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Seize the day. You see it? Or in Galatians 6.10, Paul writes, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Seize the day. A little later, in our book, in Colossians, Paul would say in Colossians 4.5, Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Seize the day. And maybe most interesting of all was James, the half-brother of Jesus' perspective, when he wrote in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this. In other words, seize the day. The writer of Hebrews would perhaps say it in the most simple, short, concise way in Hebrews 3.15 when he said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. You see, we ought to couch everything in seizing the day. And if you're ever going to develop a prayer life before him, you know when you ought to do it? Now. Now's a good time to start. I mean, you've got about three weeks of a few little lessons at how to pray. We know now that prayer is not about me getting things. It's about me getting God. It's not about me asking for his blessings every single day. It's asking me to get to know God personally, intimately, to know his heart. It's me asking God to help me to grow in my love and to share his glory with others and, and, and to help others get to know. You, you get that, right? We're getting an idea of what that. When would, should we begin this? When should we start? Today. Today's the day. And I want you to see from this passage that we're looking at today in Colossians, the first chapter, verses 9 through 14, I want you to see this beautiful prayer that he prays. Because here's, here's what we're going to learn. Now, I know I say stuff like this every single week, and we laugh about this, and sometimes it freaks people out. And, but, but I want you to understand that he gives us a six-fold sermon here. <laughs> it is, Dean. Do you see that? I read all those things, and the whole time I'm reading them, y'all are, are counting, right? You're going, oh, no, we're going to be here a while, right? He gives us these six ways that we ought to be praying for ourselves and praying for one another about our prayer life. And so here's what I'm going to do right now. Just right up front, I'm going to give you the six points because there's no way on God's earth that I'm going to get six points today. I'm going to mention every one of these, okay? And I'm going to give you the six things, and we're going to get as far as we can. But I think this prayer is so powerful. This is what we ought to be praying, okay? So I want you to see these. These are some ways we ought to be praying. According to Paul in this prison prayer that he prayed in Colossians chapter, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, jot these things down. They're all um, so important for us. So I want you to see them. They'll be up on the screen, and I'm going to talk, probably get through about maybe two, maybe three. I don't know if we're going to see. We're going to try real hard, okay? But here's the six. So that after this is over, you don't come, over, come up to me and go, well, what was number two, three, four, five, and six? You only got to one, right? So you're going to have them. Here they are. You ready? This is what we ought to be praying. This is how this prison prayer goes. We ought to be praying um, to be guided by the will of God. Write fast. If you've got shorthand, that'll help, right? Pray to be guided by the will of God. Second, pray to be guarded by the wisdom of God. 
guarded by the wisdom of God. We're going to see this in this passage. I think I'll get to those two at least. All right? Pray to be gratifying in your walk with God. Pray to walk worthy. We're going to hear that. You'll see it in the passage. Fourth, see, we're already to point four, aren't you proud? Pray to be growing in your work for God. These are all there in Paul's prayer. This is what Paul prayed for believers at Colossians. This is what he would pray for us. Fifth, pray to be grounded in our witness for him, for God. And the sixth point is, pray to be grateful in your worship of God. Now, you can walk out of here today and go, we got a six-point sermon today, and he did it by 1140. There you go. All right? I, I, I want you to hear this. I think this is carp diem prayer, prayer that seizes the day. I don't know if you see that. But, but, but it's all about you and I praying for us to be all that God's called us to be. Now, I want to work through these one at a time, and I want us to get a picture of this because I, th I think it's um, so powerful, so important for us to, to hear these. And this comes straight from God's Word. So, so you can take this passage home in Colossians 1, beginning in verse 9, and you can find all of those six things there about how to pray, what I ought to be praying for. Some people say, well, I just don't know what to pray. There, now you do. That, there it is. That's what we ought to be praying. Now, first of all, he's telling us this. Pray to be guided by the will of God. That's a big ask, isn't it? That, that, that's, that's a big prayer if you think. Pray to be guided by the will of God. Now, that's the very first thing that we're supposed to pray according to Paul in Colossians chapter 1. To, to, to be guided by the will of God. And it's a big one because I think all the others kind of flow out of this one. That they're all kind of connected to this. I think you'll see this. And you may be thinking, well, where do you see that? Well, you see it right in the very first part of verse 9. If you look at your Bible there, you'll see where this is coming from. We're to pray to be guided by the will of God. Look what it says. Paul says, for this reason, since you're a believer, since I have love for you as a believer, since you know Jesus and have made him the Lord of your life, for this reason, we also, since we heard of that, we don't cease to pray for you. And here's what we ask. Look what he asked. First of all, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That, that's what you ought to pray. God, fill me with the knowledge of his will. You can pray that right now. You can seize this moment. And you can pray that right now. God, fill me with the knowledge of your will. All right? And I think that's a powerful prayer for us to begin to pray. That could change everything. We're to begin every single day by asking God to fill us with this understanding of his will. To be guided by his will. Because if you're living in the will of God, every other part of your Christian life will fall into place. If you're walking under him, if you're filled with his will. Now, this is very interesting because when we hear the word filled, we think of a cup that's filled up, right? That's what we think of when we hear the word filled. And that's very interesting. But the Greek phrase there that's translated as to be filled, look at your Bible there. It says that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will is a very interesting phrase in the Greek language. And I'm telling you that when we read our English translation, sometimes we kind of leave with a false notion of what it's really talking about. The Greek phrase there, to be filled, means to be controlled by. Now read it like that. Pray that you will be controlled by the will of God. Pray that you will be controlled by this knowledge of the will of God. Now there's a couple of things there that I want you to think about. What does it really mean to be filled? If you think about this, if you are filled with hunger, it means you're controlled by your appetite, right? That, that, that's what we're really saying. So, so we get that use of, if you are filled with anger, what's the problem? You're going to be controlled by your anger. And that's the idea that he's given there. We ought to be filled with something. In the, in, in the Christian life, we talk about be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do for us? guides us. He guides us in the way we ought to go. And, and that's very related to what we're talking about here. Christians are to be filled, controlled by the will of God. His will, his direction in our life 
ought to outweigh our own. Our desire ought to be to live for him, to please him. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Paul said, listen, therefore we make it our aim, our goal, our ambition, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him with a capital H, to God. Paul's goal in his life was what? To be filled, controlled by God's will. What would be pleasing to him? And that's very powerful. The NIV translates 2 Corinthians 5, 9 this way. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. And the New English translation says it like this. So then, whether we are alive or away, we make it our ambition to please him. Paul lived his life that way. Can't you see Paul sitting in a prison cell? God, whether I am preaching in a synagogue or on the street, whether I am being surrounded by those who want to take my life with stones or, or with whips, whether I'm sitting in shackles in a prison cell, my only ambition is to be controlled by your will for my life. I'm telling you that gives everything you do a whole new focus. Our prayer as believers, listen, ought to be that we would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God every day. Now, some of us go, well, that's a, a big one because um, I struggle to know God's will. Can I tell you why we struggle to know God's will? We make God's will what it's not. When we talk about God's will, we always frame it in the context of a location, a vocation, or a relation. It's true. God, what's your will for me concerning this job? Do you want me to take this job or that job? Do I take the one that pays better or the one that has better hours? God, what's your will? God, do I marry this one or this one, right? This one's wealthy, this one's good looking. Which one do I marry, God? Your will, right? You get it. <laughs> but think about that. Isn't that what, how we always frame God's will? Like my wants, my wishes. It's just the same way we mess up this idea of prayer. It's all about God, give me, give me, give me. And we miss that altogether. And I want to say to you that God is not nearly as concerned as you're in your life about a location, a vocation, or a relation like that. He wants you to live in the center of his will and everything else takes care of itself. I thought about this week as I was working on this message and I thought about all the great men and women of the faith that we find in scripture. And I think about how did they find God's will? Think about Abraham. Abraham was a man of faith when God found him. He was living controlled by the will of God and God said, Abraham, I got a place for you to go, but I'm not going to tell you where. Just go. And Abraham said, but God, what's your will? I mean, your will's got to be bigger than that. Where do you want me to go? I'll tell you when you get there. Right? It, am, I, am I speaking to you? This is how God relates to us, right? And I think God said to Abraham, Abraham, you're already living in the center of my will because you're living for me. It's not about where you go. It's about who goes with you. You see that? It's not about a location or a vocation or any of those kind of things if you think about it. You and I are to follow his will. Listen to this great statement from Dr. James Mary. He says this, the biggest problems Christians have is not finding the will of God we don't know. It's obeying the will of God that we do know. Isn't that true? It's true. Th th think about that. Why would God reveal to you his will that you don't know if you're not willing to follow his will that you do know? And you go, well, what are you talking about? Do I know the will of God? Yes, because this book right here tells you his will. You, you say, well, well, this is not an exhaustive list, but let me give you a couple of these, okay? Well, what, what's the will of God for my life, according to Scripture? Here it goes. I'm telling you this morning, you ought to pray, right? You ought to pray to be filled, controlled by the will of God for a knowledge of the will of God. And guys, we may only get to one. I don't know, but this is a big one, all right? You've got the others, so don't worry about them. Just focus on this one for a second. Because if we get this one right, it can make a huge difference in our life. Well, what's the will of God? L let me share about three things with you. And this is not, again, an exhaustive list because you'll find all kinds of examples of this kind of thing in Scripture. But let me give you three big ones. When I'm praying, God help me to be controlled by the will of God. Here's a couple of them. Number one, get this down. God's will is that you be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. According to Scripture, His will is that you, Christian, look more and more like Jesus every single day and less and less like 
Buddy or Patsy, right? You, you get what I'm saying? That you look more and more like him and less and less like the world. You look more and more like holy God than you do like sinful man. That we are being more and more every day conformed to the image of his son. And you go, how do you know that's God's will? Because the Bible says it. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, listen to this. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And look at this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my, your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is it telling us God's will is? To not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed and changed and conformed to him. Paul would also say in that great passage we love to quote in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, and we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are calling according to his purpose. Now, what's his purpose? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image. What is God's will for my life that I need to be filled with? I need to be being more like Jesus every single day. That doesn't have to do with where you go who you're with, right? Wherever you go, whoever you're with, if you're controlled by the will of God, you're looking more and more like Jesus all the time. And what will that do for you wherever you are, wherever you go? It'll be life-changing. Second, get this one. Yeah, you're getting three points here in the middle of the first point, so stay with me, all right? Second, God's will is that you be set apart for his services, for his purposes, God's will is that you be set apart for his service, set apart for his purpose. In other words, that your life would be used by him, that, that your life would not be lived for yourself, but would be used for him, set apart for him. Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more just as you receive Jesus, as you received from us, how you ought to walk to please God. For you know that what commandments that we gave to you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What does it mean to be sanctified? Set apart. Set apart for his services. What's the will of God for my life as a believer? that I should look more like Jesus and my life should not be lived for me but lived for him, set apart for his purposes. Pretty clear. Third one, you ready? What's God's will? I'm praying, God, every will, they help me to be filled with the knowledge of your will, controlled by the will of God for my life. What is it? The will of God is that every day I'm looking more like Jesus. Every day I'm set apart for his services. Third, God's will is that you, your life, glorify him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and obey him forever. And Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 10, 38, whatever you do, do all to the will, glory of God. What is his will? That our life should glorify him, not ourselves. Now, don't just think about that. That's just three. Not an exhaustive list. I've just pulled three out of Scripture for you to understand. We are to be filled and controlled and praying to be filled and controlled by His will every single day. And that will change everything about you, how you live, how you relate to others, how you walk with Him. If you're saying, Lord, fill me, fill me every day with your will. That's so powerful to me if you think about it. 1 Peter 2, 8, 15 says this, For this is the will of God, that by de doing good you may silence the ignorance of foolish men as you live surrendered and devoted to him. Our biggest problem is not in finding God's will, it's in doing it. The story is told of George W. Truett, who was a longtime very famed pastor at First Baptist Church of Dallas. And jo George Truett said this, and I love this statement. He said this, um, to find the will of God is the greatest discovery. To know the will of God is life's greatest knowledge. But to do the will of God is life's greatest achievement. And you think about this, where do I find the will of God? Right, right here. And then how do I do the will of God? Pray every day. Pray every day. 
to live controlled by the will of God, to follow him in his will. And remember this, listen, that that's the greatest achievement you can find in your life is for you to be filled, controlled, led by him. That's the first point, all right? That's what he says in this passage of Scripture. Now, look at your Bible there in Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day that we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of him. And look, look at this, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That, that, that's, that's the second one that I gave you a minute ago. Pray to be guided by the wisdom of God. So, so, so you see how these two play into each other? What is wisdom? Following the will of God. What should I be praying? That I would be controlled by the will of God and I would have the wisdom to follow it. Think about that. Knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing, right? You, you can have a knowledge of the will of God, but it does you no good to know that it's God's will that you look more and more like Jesus, that you are set apart for his services and that you glorify. It does you no good to sit in a church and know that's the truth if you have the knowledge, but you don't have the wisdom to live it when you walk out of here. You and I have to put it into practice. And I feel this way every single Sunday when we gather in this place. It is not enough to come to church and hear God's word preached if it's not going to go past these walls and this door. That's just head knowledge. You're hearing it. You're hearing it preach. You might even be touched and stirred by it. It might make you cry. And you may say, listen, that was such a good message today. But I'm just telling you, I am wasting my time if that's all it is, is a message that lands flat and hangs out in this room. It has to change how we live every single day. That's wisdom. Pray that knowing the will of God would not be enough for you, but you would have a wisdom and spiritual discernment to live it out every single day to live for him. And that's the call. That's what you and I are to do with our life every single day. You and I are to live out the will of God, to do it his way. I think that's powerful. Here's another quote from Dr. James Merritt. I really got into him on this one because he has a lot of really good things to say on the subject of following God's will and what that looks like. James Merritt said this. He said, when you have the God-given wisdom to always do God's will in every situation, when your heart is right in line with God, you don't have to find the will of God. The will of God will find you. It's true. The more you live it, have the wisdom to live out what he tells you every single day, the more you're going to know the direction that he wants you to go and what he wants you to do and how he wants you to live every single day. That's all a part of this prayer that we're reading about in this passage of Scripture. You and I are to follow him every day. When you pray, you should pray that not only you would be guided by the will of God, but you'd be guarded by the wisdom of God. I shared with you last week an example of the difference between wisdom and knowledge, right? Do y'all remember it? Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in your fruit salad, right? You got it? That should stick with you guys. It did with me, right? Think about that. You can have a knowledge of something that does no good if you don't use the knowledge for his glory. If you don't use the knowledge in a part of being set apart for his service. Using that knowledge to be more like Jesus every single day. Make me more like you every single day. That ought to be the prayer of our heart. I don't know about you, but I love the idea that prayer is the very air that we breathe every single day. And when I think about that, I can see why it's so important for the life of a believer to pray, God, help me every day to live controlled by your will and have not just the knowledge of your will. I've shared a little bit of that with you today, but have the wisdom to do it. I pray that even as we leave this place today, we would have the wisdom to honor and worship and glorify God every single day in our life by the words that we say, the choices that we make. That we would have the wisdom to follow Jesus when he gives us opportunities to share about the greatest Savior this world could ever have in Jesus Christ. That we would have the, not just the knowledge, but the wisdom to lead our, family, our families by the principles and standards found in his word. That we would have not just the knowledge of what it means to live a godly life, but we would live a fully surrendered life to him in all wisdom and understanding. My prayer is that our prayers would turn into more than just asking God for things and asking us to be more like him. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer?
with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask Nancy to come and just begin to play our hymn of invitation. It's, it's one that will be familiar with you. It's just, just a confession to God. Without you, I could do nothing. And it's true. God, give me the wisdom to know that without you, I can do nothing. Now, we've spoken today of carp diem praying, praying that seizes the day. Today, this day, right? God, help me to live controlled by your will. God, God, this day, help me to be wise enough not just to know it, but to do it, to live it. And listen, if God's spoken to your heart in this service today, he could have said all kinds of things. Maybe even through the simple scriptures I read about seizing the day. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Today. Or this one from Paul. Today is the day of salvation. Seize the day, right? Maybe that's the message you heard. I think when we hear words like that, I think we need to understand that if God is speaking to your heart today, do something about it today. Seize the day. Every day we ought to seize the opportunity to pray. pray. We talked about that. But right now, in the quietness of this moment, if God's speaking to some hearts, oh, there's some Christians in here who just need to recommit their prayer life to God. God, I thank you, Father, for the last few weeks where you've shown us what our prayer life ought to look like. God, right now in this place, I pray that I might know you better more intimately, deeply. I pray that I might grow in my love for others and that my faith might show to others and that my life might glow to your glory. I I pray for that. I pray, God, like we talked about today, I pray that you would help me to be controlled by your will every single day, even if that will means stepping out in an aisle this morning, seizing the day and making a commitment to you or a recommitment to you or a life commitment to be a part of a church family, or to follow you in believer's baptism, or whatever that is. God, I don't want to miss that. Help me to seize the day and follow your will today. Give me the wisdom, the wisdom, not just to hear it, but to act on it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing this song as a declaration to him, without you I can do nothing. And then we're going to ask you to surrender afresh to him. If you need to come this morning, the altar will be open. Our ministers will be here at the front to receive you. Or you can make that pew, that seat where you're sitting this morning, your altar. As you say, God, I don't want to miss this opportunity today. I want to seize this moment. I want to pray to recommit myself to you. I want to pray to recommit myself to looking more and more like Jesus every single day, surrendering myself to you. I want to pray that I might know you better, that I might grow in you. I want to pray that. You see, I don't know what God said in your heart, but whatever it is, let's don't leave this place today without seizing the moment. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word this morning. Thank you for guiding us through this time together. God, I pray now that your Holy Spirit would take the word you've spoken in our lives, mine included. And God, you'd help us not to miss this moment with you, this opportunity. Help us to seize the moment, to pluck the day right now. God, help us not to harden our heart, but surrender our heart fully to you and follow you. I pray that if there's any in this place today who need to come, you'd give them the courage to step out by faith and to come. And we will give you and you alone all the praise and the honor and the glory in that. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our song of invitation? The words will be on the screen. Without you, I could do nothing.
Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being um, so attentive today as I got through basically two points of six, but you got all six, right? Um, so you guys kind of know where that's headed. Go back and study that passage. Such a rich, rich prayer for us to be praying every day for ourselves and knowing how to do that. And I've, I've loved this series, so I hope that it's helping you like it's helping me just to um, grow my own prayer life and, and kind of understand what he asked us to pray for. Um, so thank you guys for being here this morning, being attentive to that. If you're visiting with us, thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, I hope that it has been worth your time. I believe that it has and that you'll be blessed by that and that as you walk out those doors today, you'll rejoice um, at getting to hear from him today. Um, don't forget about opportunities of service coming up. We've got all kinds of things going on in the life of our church. There is OCC that we're collecting for uh, toys and things like that right now. We've got men's Bible study. I mean, men's prayer group men's breakfast <laughs> coming up uh, pretty quick the signups out there um, in the hallway we got stuff from tabitha sewing so all kinds of places for you to be involved and be a part uh, of the ministry of the church and so you're always invited to come and share in those times uh, get to enjoy uh, that also um, but at this time we want to close out our service and uh, get you guys on your way as you leave out of here to kind of not just follow the will of god right and know about it but to follow it wisely uh, to live what he's called us to be. I'm going to ask Gary White, who's our deacon for the week, if he would come and close us out in prayer, and then we'll sing our, our song together and kind of head out of here. Lead us, brother, if you would. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for bringing us here today, Father. Thank you for this wonderful service that we've had, and thank you for the beautiful day. Father, as we start this new week, we'd ask that you just lay a path of righteousness in front of each and every one of us, Father. Help us to stay on that path, Father. Help us not to stray. Put your arms and your shields and your armor around us, Father, to help us fight off the evils of this world. We cannot live here without your help. Father, we just ask that you would lift the blindness of the eyes that Satan has put up on so many people. Help them to see your power and your glory, Father. Help us to see you in us as we walk this path of righteousness. Father, help, a, help us to make America great again. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful church we have. We thank you for the people that come here every Sunday, Father. We ask that you would help them return to us next Sunday. Father, we just thank you for all the blessings you give us. We thank you for Brother Buddy, for Trey, and all the other people who have such a, play such a great hand in making this church what it is. We thank you for the blessings that you give us. Father, we ask you to forgive us for all of our sins. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.